and liability. And first of all, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly humbled to see so many participants uh, joining in, logging in from all corners of the globe. We've got contingents here today spanning North and Latin America right through to the um, Far East. So thank you ever so much for those of you who joined us at a particularly importune um, time zone. And of course, a very big thanks to going out to those of you joining us from the UK, where it is in fact lunchtime. And we very much hope to provide all participants with a, a veritable feast of insight and perspective in terms of some of the, uh, the matters on, on the agenda, befitting of such a, a very well-informed and large international audience, which actually spans quite considerable parts of the legal and marine autonomy communities, which is absolutely fantastic to see. Now, the task of covering even selected policy, regulatory and liability implications of autonomous ships in just 60 minutes is uh, no small task. In fact, it's a quite vertiginously tall order, but it's very much with the enormity of that challenge in mind that we've invited our two guest speakers. And it's with great pleasure for me to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Katrina Kemp. Katrina is the uh, Autonomy Technical Specialist at the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency and her work centers around coordinating the MCA's policy and regulatory response to autonomous shipping. Amongst other things, she represents the UK at the MAS Working Group within the Maritime Safety Committee and works very closely with uh, the MAS industry as part of the IMO's regulatory scoping exercise. She also works on a number of domestic uh, policy initiatives as well. So Katrina, why don't you come on in and say hi. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Thanks Katrina, you're most welcome. It's with equally great pleasure that I now introduce our second speaker, James Turner QC. James is a barrister and arbitrator practicing out of Quadrant Chambers in London. He's a recognized international commercial lawyer with expertise that span a range of sectors. But in particular for today's purposes, he's appeared in some of the most seminal cases in both wet and dry shipping law at least some of which my students should in fact be reading as we uh, speak. He's also the co-author of the Law and Practice of Admiralty Matters. James, come on in, say hello. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for having me along, Robert. You're more than welcome. Good afternoon, James. Well, thank you both uh, very much indeed for um, being here. Um, the only thing to uh, uh, say at uh, this point is to say that we're clearly in very capable hands. Very much last of all, um, and at least of all in this instance, is myself. I'm a maritime, an academic maritime uh, lawyer here at the university with a particular interest in wet shipping and admiralty matters. I've been lucky enough to be involved in a number of research projects and consultancies relating to um, things MAS and also represented the CMI on the MAS working group, both within the maritime safety and uh, legal committees. Now, in terms of the running order, ladies and gentlemen, Katrina is going to um, speak to us first about some of the important um, policy considerations and work underway, both domestically and at the IMO, amongst other things. I will then detain you for the interim period to cover autonomy regulation before hopefully very seamlessly segueing into James, who's going to give us a practitioner's take on some of the important liability implications of autonomy. Um, we will, of course, well, not of course, we will hopefully at least leave a healthy amount of time at the end for questions. And I should say that you can ask as an audience member a question at any time during the webinar. Please click on the Q&A um, button, which is either at the top or bottom of your uh, screens. You can do that at any, at any time and I'd encourage you to, uh, to ask questions and we will endeavour to answer as many questions as we can at the end once we've heard from all three speakers. So hopefully there'll be some nice discussion afterwards. The last item of the day, I should also say that we are recording this webinar with a view to um, posting on um, Law School, University of Southampton social media at, uh, at some stage in case you wanted to review something afterwards. Okay, um, before I hand over to uh, Katrina, let me just take just a moment to, to set the scene. I think it's fair to say that things that may broadly be described as autonomous are nothing new or is nothing new to the marine domain. Um, things like uh, smaller 
underwater autonomous vehicles have been around, around for, for many, many um, decades. Of course, what we've seen in recent years is um, an incremental increase in size, as well as a measured migration to the um, water surface, with the technology now being deployed in an increasingly broad range of applications, spanning, yes, the military, the marine scientific research communities, but also increasingly in modern times, the, um, the commercial world uh, as well. Um, it's, however, the, the prospect of full-sized merchant ships carrying passengers and freight has really only come into the, the general public consciousness in more, in more recent years. And in fact, the changes in the marine autonomy sector just over the last decade or so have been really nothing short of um, remarkable. When I first got into marine autonomy, I first started um, uh, auto uh, project work on marine autonomy back in the early 2010s. And I think it would be fair to say, just speaking anecdotally, it, it seemed to me that the industry, both developers of the technology, users of it, really approached the matter of regulation with quite some anxiety. The, the industry-wide consternation was actually quite palpable. And there were, was genuine fear in some quarters that just one minor incident, just one misstep, might just cause the whole thing to unravel. The authorities under public pressure would intervene and, and as it were, that would be that. Needless to say, since then, there's been a complete change in the zeitgeist, in the atmosphere. Okay, now that's not to say that um, marine autonomy stakeholders now adopt a cavalier approach to uh, regulation and safety, far from it. But the marine autonomy sector that we look at today is one that I think is much more self-assured and confident in itself. And I think there are three related but distinct reasons for this. The first is the continued and excellent development in the technology itself and its applications. Okay, that's the foundation for everything. It's the lifeblood of the sector. The second is the very proactive and reciprocal engagement between the MAS community and domestic regulators. I'm sure Katrina will touch on this in just a moment in her piece. The third, however, is the decision of the IMO's Maritime Safety Committee in 2017 to put the regulation of autonomous ships very squarely and firmly on its work agenda. Okay. Not only did this represent the first tangible step of the integration of autonomous ships into the legal framework, it was also simultaneously both evidence of, but also a quite crucial contributor towards the legitimization of autonomy in many of the minds of those usually involved in mainstream merchant shipping. I have absolutely no doubt it's why so many of you are on this call this afternoon. Nevertheless, in spite of the huge strides that have been made, have been made up to this point, there is still an awful long way to go, as Katrina will know only too well, not least from a policy standpoint. And in that regard, Katrina, we're all yours. Thank you very much, Robert. So um, my, what I'm going to do now for the next few minutes is to give you a bit of context as to actually what are we talking about when we talk about mass. Um, but I'll also talk to you about some of the challenges from our perspective as a regulator, um, give you a flavour of some of our policy priorities and what we're working on now, where we're going, and then build on what Robert's just said about what the IMO has been up to to, to set um, Robert and James's talk into context in that larger arena. So we all talk about mass, we talk about autonomous ships. What do we actually mean and what do they look like? Now, if you've seen the, the, the large, uh, fancy artistic impressions, they're one thing and they're, they're, they're where maybe we may be going in the future. But right now in the UK, autonomy primarily, primarily looks like this. It's primarily under 24 meters. So they're small vessels. There's nothing wrong with that, but that, that, that's the range we're looking at. And I thought I'd take the opportunity now to sort of walk you through some of the examples and what they do. Um, so on the right at the bottom, we've got a yellow uh, sea worker, and this is from a company that was called ASV. They've now um, been bought out by L3 Harris. Um, these vessels, that yellow one is about five meters. So again, quite small, but it will do a lot of marine survey work. 
As you can see, some of these look more like ships, some of them don't. Um, if we move clockwise um, to the bottom, we've got another um, vessel from L3 Harris. This one's actually gone over to the Royal Navy, but again, it's an autonomous, remotely operated vessel. Um, slightly bigger than the, the sea workers, but again, it's still under that under 24 meter bracket. The far one on the left hand side, the black, black, very low profile vessel is from a company called XOcean. And they do a lot of uh, seabed mapping and hydrographic work, um, also some oil and pipeline surveys. Again, this vessel is very different in its look to what we consider a ship or a vessel to look like. Um, yeah, okay. And then if we keep going clockwise to the, uh, well, I'll, the stripy one at the top, apologies, um, but I think that's the best way to direct you towards it. This is the USV Max Limer. This is, this is one of the larger ones we, we've had dealings with, and this is a 12 meter vessel um, that has done a variety of seabed mapping work. Um, it can deploy a, a, a submersible um, payload off the back of the vessel to assist with that seabed mapping. It was also part of the X Prize the competition, I was gonna say last year, but it might've been the year before, um, and it, it won that competition. It also did um, our first, the UK's first at least, international um, remotely operated vessel trial between the UK and Belgium, and that took place in May 2019. Um, moving on, the small one at the top does similar work to the X-Ocean black one in the corner. And I think I highlighted this one because to give you the idea that actually they, they're very different, these vessels. They can look very different, but they're doing similar tasks. Um, some are purpose-made, um, some are retrofitted, some are almost prototype design, and that's just the nature of, of the industry, but we are moving very, very quickly. Underneath that middle one, we have an autonaut, and this is primarily used for oceanographic research, and will be out deep sea, a lot further away from the coastline. Um, and then the other one we have is the grey one at the top right, and this is also built by ASV slash L3 Harris, but part of Tarlis's work and is looking at minesweeping work, so it will go over to the, uh, the MOD. So as you can see, there's quite a range of vessels that we're dealing with. And I think it's good best to be clear at this point, these are all remotely operated. There is a human in the loop, somebody is in control of that vessel, they're just not on board that vessel. However, that's where we are today. We do though have larger vessels being planned and that we are working with at the moment. So you may have seen in the news um, recently or the, the maritime press, uh, the Armada fleet that's being developed. These vessels are very similar to doing the hydrographic survey, the oil and pipeline, work and those sort of remits, but they're much larger. So they have proposals for 21 meter, 36 meter, and um, also much bigger than that. So for us, that takes us into a different set of regulations. The very bottom, we have um, a proposal from Anglo-Belgian shipping company for a 90, 90 meter vessel that will be do short sea shipping containerization. And again, this is another area that's very different, um, but could see real benefits to remotely operated or more autonomous vessels. And then the top right one is uh, the Mayflower. And this is a, a vessel that proposes to do a transatlantic crossing as part of the Mayflower anniversary, 400 anniversary, hoping for full autonomy. And that presents us with a lot of challenges, but it's really good to see the range of innovation and industry pushing the boundaries of what they want to do within shipping. So all of these um, present us with a range of challenges. Um, firstly, as a regulator, and I don't think this will be a surprise to anyone on the call, the regulations have all been written with the assumption that there is a human on board that vessel. So for us, the first task is actually identifying which of these regulations are actually barriers? What does it say actually say in the regulation? And does that stop the remote operation? 
or is it just there's been an interpretation and assumption that that person is on the vessel and actually there's some nuances we can work around so that's our first challenge is the assumption that the human is on board is ingrained in the regulations and again i don't think i need to tell this audience but I, one of the challenges for us is the complex network of maritime regulation so we have the international regulations, we have the domestic regulations, and then we have the local authority areas that have their own ways of doing things and their own requirements, and their own regulations. And as a challenge, you could sit there and go, well, we're going to wait for the international regulations to sort themselves out before we do anything. But as Robert hinted to in the introduction, the industry is moving too fast for us to do that. We have to try and keep up. And to do that, that means we have to try and make some amendments and some allowances within our domestic regulations to support this innovation and to support the industry. And that's a challenge to make sure that actually we can still be in line with where that international regulation goes in the future. The other challenge for us is actually the increased autonomy. So oddly, remote operation as much as that's quite a big leap still involves a human there's still somebody in control of that vessel once we move beyond that into the idea of artificial intelligence and machine learning we're in a whole new realm of challenges that are beyond anything we have considered previously within our maritime sector and within the maritime regulation so that's very broadly there are many many other challenges and i'm sure you're aware of them but that very broadly is the challenges that we face how do we deal with that at the moment as you can see on those first two slides we are supporting projects we are allowing the vessels out there to operate but to do that we're using um, exemptions or waivers and that's a very that's not a that's not a solution to the problem that's a way of us supporting industry at the current time and part of that to issue those exemptions and waivers is to provide a safety case evidence to show us that you to show us and assure us that the vessel is safe and can operate safely and is safe for the environment and safe for other users even though there's no one on board that vessel but that is only a temporary measure the longer term goal is to actually incorporate all this into regulations and in terms of our priorities, we're actually starting to do that. The vessels are under 24 metres and normally covered by the workboat code. So we are working with our code team to actually update the workboat code and include an annex specifically on the requirements for remotely operated unmanned vessels. The challenges we have there is about making sure that what we introduce isn't out of date by the time that becomes that comes into force so we're moving towards a slightly more goal-based what is the aim of this particular requirement so that we can keep up with the technology to the best of our abilities it will be our first marker of regulating these vessels so it's not going to be a here you go off you go do what you like there will be limits on what we can include in that documentation so that's one of our key priorities the other is actually supporting the projects is supporting the the innovators and industry out there wanting to get vessels on the water and what we can do to support that for the uk as a maritime nation but we're also supporting projects that are doing research research in areas where we don't necessarily have the knowledge or it's a new innovation that we need to be understanding and that might be data related it might be sensor related um, it might be related to you know the review of large regulations for larger vessels the other piece of work we've got going on is a working group that was established and you might have seen a press release in the last couple of weeks called mass people and this is about establishing and being a world leading set of training for those people that will be operating these vessels and for us that's really important it's not just about the safety of that vessel it's about the people operating them and that they have the right training and the right skills to manage that now and in the future so there are very immediate priorities 
The next ones are looking at the regulations that affect those larger vessels, those that are over 24 metres. And, and having those three words on the slide do not show the extent for that actually, what that will involve. Um, it, it sort of ex exponentially just expands the amount of regulations we need to look at and the amount of barriers we will potentially come across. So that's where we will be looking next. We also need to increase our understanding of how we regulate this increased automation. And then finally, our IMO engagement. So as part of um, the small pandemic, which means we're doing this virtually, it's also meant that the way in which IMO has operated has had to change in the last year. IMO has um, held its meetings virtually. And that also meant that some of the discussions were, were quite rightly, if I'm personally honest, put on hold because there were other higher priorities that needed to be dealt with at an international level, in particular in relation to seafarers. However, what the IMO have been doing, and I'm just going to flesh out a bit of what Robert um, hinted at in the introduction, is these regulatory scoping exercises. It established this work package to review the regulations at an international level to identify barriers and gaps and identify how they could be addressed, whether we were going to amend regulations or whether we needed to develop new codes of practice or new codes to support these types of vessels. So anyone that knows the IMO, there's a variety of committees. Um, the Mar Maritime Safety Committee has led the way on this one and started its scoping exercise in 2017, quickly followed by the Legal Committee the following year and then the Facilitation Committee the year after that. At the current time, the MEPC Committee has not commenced its scoping exercise, but we are a long way to completing the work that the other committees have already started. So for your perspective, um, the MSC committee did agree with a definition for the purpose of the work that a, that a maritime autonomous surface ship was a ship which, to a varying degree, can operate independent of human interaction. And for us, it is only for the scoping exercise, but it gave that broad range of options that autonomy could be. And from that, we then also established degrees of autonomy. And it's really important that we highlight its degrees. It's not a hierarchy. We are not aiming for full autonomy. It is a range in which vessels could potentially operate. So the first degree is a ship with automated processes and decision support. And this is primarily a conventional vessel with, as it says, as it says in the label, automated processes and assist additional technology that will support the seafarers on board. The second degree is a remotely controlled vessel with seafarers on board, not necessarily controlling the vessel, but they might be doing maintenance on the board that vessel. They might be there doing oceanographic research. There might be other reasons they're on board. We then have a third degree, which is a remotely controlled ship without seafarers on board. And what you'll have seen in those first two slides is exactly that. All of the vessels we're dealing with at the moment fit into that category. And then finally, there's that fourth degree of autonomy we call a fully autonomous ship. And even that doesn't come without questions about what do we actually mean by fully autonomous? Are we just talking navigation or are we talking about all its, all its functional operations? But those degrees gave us some focus and ensured that the review of the regulations we were doing covered the range of options that we believe would be out there. The other thing the uh, working group did um, was also to develop these interim guidelines for mass trials. And these are really important because it means for industry, it doesn't matter where you go, you will be asked broadly the same questions. And it means that when, for example, myself and my colleagues in, in Belgium were organising the and supporting the C-Kit trials for the USV Max Lima, we were on the same page. We knew what we needed to be talking about and asking about. And that helps both us and industry. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up and next for us is that next IMO meeting in May where we will reconvene and start to discuss um, and hopefully work towards the conclusion of the scoping exercises. Obviously that will be a virtual meeting, but it's, it'll be good to actually get back in the room, so to speak, with my colleagues from different member states. Hang on, not quite. <laughs> 
Um, the other two items I was just going to say was that we're still working on our, our process to ensure that anyone with novel technologies, not just an autonomous vessel, can actually um, come to us and um, get their vessels in water. And then finally, it's a case of watch this space for an update on the workboat code. Um, and if you have any questions on those, please contact myself, Ruth or Robert, who are all Robert Gale, who are all part of our Maritime Future Technologies team. And I'll hand back to Robert slightly beyond the time I should have done, so I do apologise. No problem, Katrina. Um, thank you very much for that, Katrina. That's uh, incredibly uh, helpful and actually provides a rather nice foundation for what uh, I'm going to discuss. And um, in the time that's available to me, ladies and gentlemen, which isn't a huge amount, I want to do a few things. I'm not going to uh, detain an audience as informed as this with, uh, at any great length um, with the um, regulatory, the types of regulatory compliance challenges that are presented to autonomous ships. But I will go through this by way of recap as a preface to what I'm going to say in my presentation. I want to though spend at least a healthy amount of time looking ahead to the reform of the current framework and what ideas I have in terms of um, how the framework might look. And secondly, or rather uh, thirdly, I want to get on to considering how the nature of any reformed regulatory framework might affect on certain aspects of civil liability before I hand over to James to give us the, the practitioner's uh, take on this. I think it's important when you are considering the regulatory challenges um, to address the matter holistically and to recognize the multi-tiered um, levels of the governance of shipping. So of course it starts with the general requirements stemming from the law of the sea. It's codified in large part by the UN Law of the Sea Convention. And of course in due course, the requirements, the general obligations are particularized in the constellation of conventions and regulations under the auspices of the IMO and its various subcommittees before being transposed, at least in many cases, into domestic legislation. So just again, by way of recap, we're looking at the, the law of the sea uh, framework. I think the general consensus is that we don't need to rip up the rule book here which is perhaps just as well given the, the relative inertia and complexities of any reform at this level. And what I mean by that essentially is, well, the flag state principle essentially still makes sense. There are certain complexities that are presented by a distinct foreign remote control center, but the, the principle still broadly makes sense. There's no reason why a unmanned vessel should not be registered and flagged, as in fact we've already seen in the, uh, in the UK with the sea worker, and therefore why it shouldn't enjoy freedom of navigation and innocent passage. The one thorny thing I can spot with in the UNCLOS framework, of course, is the very clear requirement for ships to be in the charge of a master. And this is a pervasive issue to the extent it not only underpins other UNCLOS obligations. I'm thinking of the obligation to render assistance, for instance, but it also permeates, of course, right through the IMO framework, both its um, regulations and civil liability conventions. And of course, that does present challenges for unsupervised autonomous um, vessels, certainly our traditional understanding of the master at any rate. The master, the post, it isn't actually defined in UNCLOS, so perhaps there is some scope for a slightly more expansive interpretation of the post in line with developing practices and regulations, but um, it's still a, a problematic component. If we're talking about the IMO framework, and I'll be very brief here, ladies and gentlemen, there are indeed regulatory challenges that depend on the type of um, operations you're dealing with. So if we're dealing with a, an unmanned vessel or a periodically unmanned vessel, there are actually a relatively small number of provisions that do call for the onboard attendance of personnel. So just some examples here, I've got regulation 16 of SOLAS chapter four, calling for the carriage on board of um, personnel qualified in radio communications. Another example is found here in the STCW code chapter eight, with its requirement that um, at no time should the bridge be left unattended. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, this is another example of a different regulatory problem, which is the ubiquitous references throughout the framework to the ship's bridge and the questions of whether or not this can be satisfied with a remote control center, either ashore or on a mother vessel. <clears throat> 
We also have many requirements again in the framework for the carriage on board of the ship's documentation. And I know that the um, creation of a, a digitized alternative, a technological alternative for conventional onboard documentation is an important priority for the mass community moving forward. As well as the clearly problematic provisions in the IMO framework, the framework is also replete with ambiguities, including perhaps most notably in the specific provisions that actually deal with safe manning. So here I've got on the slide here, regulation 14 of SOLAS chapter five, and the regulation does not actually clarify whether sufficient or efficient manning will actually allow for a fully unmanned vessel so long as its autonomous technology is good enough to compensate for the, on, the absence of an onboard captain or seafarer. And it's uh, safe to say that the same lack of clarity on this specific point is also found in related IMO uh, guidance. Of course, we have um, a similar position in some respects in Colreg Rule 5. Many of you will know this, the requirement for ships at all times to maintain a proper lookout by sight and hearing. It's not clear whether this can be met with, say, a, a remote controller with the benefit of cameras and a live feed, or even more radically by data processing alone. And of course, how can I forget the age old example, Colreg Rule 2. Is it ever consistent with um, the seamanship standard to defer completely and entirely to an autonomous system? Um, Concrete answers really cannot be found in the wording of the, uh, of the instruments alone. And in fact, it's actually with uncanny timeliness that just last week, the UK Supreme Court passed judgment on um, its first collision case since I believe 1976, which is some time ago now. Um, um, and I think James is going to touch on the other smart in his uh, case studies uh, when he deals with liability a little bit later. But it suffices to say that um, concrete answers cannot be found in the wording of these instruments alone. So I'm really pleased to see IMO taking steps at the international level to bring some clarity. However, it's always been very clear to me that the biggest challenge is the yawning gaps in the current framework when it comes to the credentials for the autonomous tech itself, yes, but also the standards of training and the new skill sets that are inevitably required by the new technology. And the absence of it is a big problem. Without this uh, benchmark, it becomes very difficult for a range of stakeholders to manage what is a very serious liability risk. And I think plugging this gap is going to require a lot of efforts and perhaps more importantly, coordination from a range of stakeholders. And I'm very pleased to see that that's already going on currently. So a little bit of uh, recap there in terms of the, the general nature of some of the regulatory problems, as I said, recap to many of you. Perhaps you'll be more interested in potential avenues for reform of that, um, of that framework. And I should say in this respect, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very much speaking for myself here, not the CMI. I'm speaking with my own academic hat on. But what can be done about some of these, about some of these problems? Well, some of the problems, at least that I've uh, shown you this morning can be resolved at least to an extent with changes to wording alone. I know there's been a lot of ongoing discussion about whether uh, an autonomy specific conventional instrument is needed and whether that's optimal or not. For my own part, this never really ever struck me as a binary. It seems that for some particular types of regulation where the underlying policy makes sense in the mass context, it might just make a lot more sense to amend the instrument at source. And certainly it seems to me that uh, a more dynamic integration in this way really underscores the pervasive nature of autonomy through the existing classes of vessel. Okay, autonomy isn't really a distinct class. It speaks about the way all vessels potentially can be operated. Okay. Having said that, the sheer volume of the likely supplementation that's going to be needed for some of the gaps that I've mentioned in my previous slide probably merits some room and space of their own. So, uh, and you know, this will be dictated by practical considerations as much as any, as much as any other, it seems to me. In any event, more interesting to me from an academic standpoint, at least, is the substantive nature of the, of the new framework. Uh, 
what will this look like? Well, it's actually no surprise to me at all that the IMO's first substantive intervention in this area is in the form of soft law. I'm of course talking about the, the IMO interim guidelines on, on MAS trials. And um, uh, as Katrina said, these um, set out um, various risk management issues pertaining to trials of mass technology. And I think soft law has a big role to play moving, moving ahead. There's no reason at all, for instance, why it can't continue to guide safe manning levels, for instance, um, in the light of an increased uptake of, of the autonomous tech. We then have uh, seemingly age-old questions about whether the new framework should be more prescriptive or goal-based in its nature. Again, I also don't think this is a binary. Clearly, a certain amount of flexibility is plainly required to give some future proofing to the framework. We also have to be a little bit careful here. It's also very important to give industry stakeholders a sufficiently defined benchmark or standard so that they can demonstrate reasonable care with some confidence. And also just with higher level autonomy and machine learning. Yes, flexibility is important, but so is at least a degree of standardization. Because there's a quite palpable risk, it seems to me, stemming from the prospect of many different machines, each learning in different ways in an effective manner of arena, but then being expected to come together and to operate safely and seamlessly on our oceans. So I think, uh, again, it's all about balance in that broad high level respect. And my last point on regulation is simply not to shut one's mind, even at this early stage, to the role that autonomy might play in the regulatory process itself. Okay, all the focus at the moment is um, paid to how do we regulate autonomy, this strange unknown quantum. But it seems to me it does have a role to play in the governance of shipping itself. And this to me seems all the more plausible in the light of ever increased interconnectivity, as well as a, a, a relative ubiquity of, of data. In any case, um, the last part of my um, session that I'll have to condense into uh, a couple of uh, minutes is really to speculate on the impact the regulatory framework has on the imposition of civil liability and the role it might play. Of course, um, those of you familiar with, the, uh, with maritime law, which is most of you, of course, know that in the maritime context, if we're talking about third party liability, it's generally channeled to the ship's owner through a range of fault based and civil liability regimes. And one of the important questions is, well, will the uptake of this technology, this technology that's supposed to be able to think and learn independently, will it see a shift in that liability away from the ship owner, for instance, and onto the developers of the autonomous technology? Well, at least to an extent, ladies and gentlemen, this really raises matters of product liability. Now, I don't have anything like time to um, explore the credentials of potential product suits against the developers of the technology in any depth, but I can at least highlight a certain number of fa factors that might be relevant when um, or if um, such um, uh, litigation is ever brought against the developers of the technology. And I'll just pick out two um, considerations, those that relate most neatly to the regulatory backdrop that I've been talking about. The first is the um, need for the relevant autonomous system to comply with any prevailing instrumental standard. Um, that won't be a complete defence, generally speaking, to product suits, but it's a, a generally a very good way of demonstrating reasonable care. And of course, the big problem in that regard is that we as a regulatory framework as a whole just do not have that concrete, robust and long-standing regulatory framework at this particular point, although there has been some very encouraging movement from classification societies in terms of their guidance documentation. Another related factor will be, I think, the um, testing or the simulation of the relevant autonomous systems in trials. That's going to be a very important way of demonstrating care in the production in the production process and it raises all sorts of questions as to exactly what stringency and quantity of testing will actually demonstrate due care and for that matter will any quantifiable or demonstrable level of safety actually be enough to um, defeat product claims in their entirety. I think this is very much a, an open question and the only thing I would finish on in terms of any shift in the liability 
away from the ship owner and onto the producers of the technology is the potential disruption that could have on the underlying limitation of liability and insurance arrangements in view of the fact of course that the um, developers of the technology of course generally will not be entitled to limitation of liability under the tonnage limitation conventions for instance which may make the procurement of suitable liability insurance much more difficult although the impact those considerations should have on pure liability in tort is perhaps a, an open question still. Time will only tell whether or not there'll be a, a big shift in the, the trajectory of liability, but I at least think we should not lose sight of the importance of the regulatory framework in that question. And now a little bit uh, overdue than uh, planned, but I would very much like at this point to shut up and get a practitioner's perspective on some of these important liability implications. James, we're all yours. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I'm not being told you can't. Um, so, I'm trying that uh, again. Uh, just an outline then, uh, I'm going to uh, expand a little on what Robert has been uh, telling us in relation to liability. I'm going to then touch on a couple of issues that seem to be pertinent uh, when it comes to the what one could call the interim stage of remote control and then um, dwell for a, a moment or two on um, the priorities as I see them for the immediate future development of Mars uh, and then finish up with some uh, case studies drawn um, uh, without embarrassment from uh, my experience. So um, starting with um, who should be liable, uh, there is of course lots of um, uh, excitement to be found among lawyers with the idea that software companies and sensor manufacturers and the like um, could be made liable. But as Robert has hinted, one really needs to stop and think about that. We currently have a well-developed, well-resourced and well-understood regime. We have a 111 year old international convention that cuts through potential conflicts of laws problems uh, and the difficulty of identifying a governing law uh, where the collision is on uh, the high seas, for example. We have accompanying conventions which uh, allow for the arrest of ships for security and jurisdiction for these and other types of claim. Uh, and this is all backed by uh, sophisticated uh, p and I, and sometimes, of course, hollow machinery uh, insurance. And underpinning all of that is the concept of the fault of the vessel. That is literally written into Articles 3 and 4 of the Collision Convention, and that finds its echo uh, in, in this country in Section 187 of the Merchant Shipping Act. Uh, but potentially undermining it all is Article 2, which um, provides, among other things, that where the cause of the collision uh, is in doubt, uh, losses lie where they fall. Now, um, if one entertains for a moment the notion of suing the writer of software alleged to have caused a collision, one's going to hit problems uh, of some or all of the following. Uh, governing law, jurisdiction, the worth of the potential uh, defendant and their insurance, um, as Robert has pointed out, there'd be no limitation of liability in a direct action. Uh, there will be contractual limitations and indemnities uh, spreading from the manufacturer to whoever uh, contracted um, with it. And then you have the problem of actually proving fault. Now, on the last point, if the vessel's navigation is driven by a machine learning algorithm, you're going to hit what is, I believe, known as the black box problem. Uh, and it is essentially that it is impossible to show why a uh, computer decided as it did. Now, in the last sort of 12 months or so, some software solutions to that have started to emerge, um, but their proper use and interpretation will certainly to start with be wide open uh, to debate. Uh, and even, even uh, all of that presupposes that one can show that the collision arose from a decision taken by uh, the computer uh, and not, say, from a faulty reading from uh, a deficient or defective sensor. So you could end up in Article 2 territory uh, if you try too hard to analyse why, say, a collision occurred. 
Now, one could look to other ways of addressing the issue, and you may or may not be familiar with the Automated and Electrical, uh, Electric Vehicles Act of 2018. And that um, attributes liability um, where there's a collision between uh, autonomous vehicles to the, ve the vehicle which caused the collision. So it, it gives up on fault and looks at cause instead. But that gives rise to problems, um, almost philosophical ones of its own, because in a, in a legal context, in a tortious context, what is cause when it is divorced from fault? Uh, and in any event, cause on its own just doesn't fit into the current international regime for ship collisions. So uh, my suggestion is that um, the touchstone uh, where ships are concerned will have to continue to be fault, assessed not by reference to why the vessel navigated as it did, but how, and whether that how is in accordance with, for example, the collision regulations and the notions of seamanship bound up in it. Uh, and it may well be artificial and, and, and even retrograde to seek to judge a ship's computer-driven navigation by reference to human standards of behavior. Uh, but for the time being, uh, at least, I see uh, no workable alternative to that. And now I'm going to move on to um, a couple of uh, issues associated with uh, remote watchkeeping. The first of all is what one might call the human resources uh, implications. As soon as you have people operating from shore, they'll be subject to working time directives, they'll be allowed time off when they're sick, they'll be allowed to pick up their children from school, uh, and, uh, and so on. And the position then will be entirely different to the uh, employment position on board a, a merchant ship. Uh, and all of that will need uh, catering for. Um, but that has a, itself a, a consequence when one thinks about the seaworthiness of a ship, because obviously one important aspect of a ship's seaworthiness is the competence of its crew. And here we have a situation, or we will have a situation, where not only are the seafarers not on board the ship, which is important because a seafarer will know uh, his or her ship and know its foibles and, uh, and its weaknesses and so on. Not only will they not be on the ship, they may never have been on the ship, quite likely they'll never have been on the ship. Uh, and indeed, as time goes by and one gradually runs out of retiring seafarers who are re-employed in uh, remote control centers, you will have a generation of um, crew who've never been on a ship at all in that capacity. Uh, and that is um, regulation uh, apart going to present real difficulties, I suggest, in terms of showing due diligence uh, to um, make the ship seaworthy um, at the appropriate times, usually at the beginning of the voyage. Um, moving on then to uh, the, the priorities as I see them going forward, and here I'm stepping into waters that I really know um, precious little about. Um, but uh, with autonomy, um, obviously there will be a central role played for by um, artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning uh, artificial intelligence requires a lot of data uh, to make it work. And one of the challenges with ships uh, as compared to roads is this, uh, that there just isn't very much data to be had compared to the um, vastness of the different um, situations that one can encounter. Uh, there was a publication last week that the merchant fleet has just hit 100,000 ships. Compare that to the many millions of road vehicles. The um, variety of sea in terms of not only the, the weather conditions, the wave conditions, but also configurations in terms of canals and traffic separation zones uh, and uh, shoaling and all the rest of it uh, is infinitely greater than the variety of conditions that one sees on a road. So the, the, the data sets from which the machines are going to learn are necessarily going to be limited. And that makes it, uh, uh, well, I should say that that is um, exacerbated by the, the current trend in NICE development, which is that one sees a lot of individual projects, but at the moment, no, um, or, or no, uh, obvious industry-wide sharing of data. 
to a lot of individual data sets, but that will be very hard for um, ships going forward to learn from. It seems to me uh, to follow that if machines are going to learn, they need all to learn from the same data sets. That's going to lead to a, a need for a, a definition of what the data set should consist of, uh, how they should be collected. Um, it, it's probably going to be too much data to be transmitted uh, from ships, so it may need to be collected physically to start with. And then how is it going to be disseminated? Both the historic data from which um, uh, computers are going to build up their, their basic ability to navigate and, and behave properly but then also real-time dissemination of data so that they go all, or all go on learning from the, the same hymn sheet. And, and so this uh, highlights, it seems to me, the need for dialogue. So Self-evidently, if two autonomous ships are navigating in the same water, they need to be talking to each other. And there's, of course, a, another issue about autonomous ships speaking to manned or remote-controlled ships. Um, but the, there is a need for dialogue too at an earlier stage between developers uh, and lawmakers and lawyers. Um, I have heard recently um, very distinguished lawyers suggest quite impossible things um, for the uh, use of technology in the maritime domain uh, and it would be very easy for um, the, the scientists and the lawmakers simply to pass each other like proverbial ships in the night um, uh, without a certain amount of care. But very quickly then I'm just going to rattle through these um, these case studies, um, just because I think they each provide uh, examples of what I've been uh, describing. The Global Mariner and the Atlantic Crusader was a collision in the Orinoco. The Global Mariner was alongside Portside 2 um, heading upstream. The Atlantic Crusader was at a single anchor in the stream, uh, more or less off the uh, starboard quarter of the Global Mariner. She was in obviously a fast flowing current and as a result was fish tailing, uh, swinging backwards and forwards about her anchor. The watch keepers on the Global Mariner failed to spot that and when they set off they managed to coincide at the extremity of one of the Atlantic Crusaders swings, um, ripped a hole in the side of the Global Mariner and she sank very sadly. The, um, so what could autonomy help with that? And the, that's uh, an example of a uh, uh, hydrographic, as it were, a, situ a hydrodynamic situation that the computers on board of the Global Mariner would have to recognize. And so time the departure from uh, the berth, turning into and across a fast flowing current so as not to coincide. Now, that could probably be done and would probably keep a better lookout than the human beings did in that case. But that's uh, an example of a, um, what for land lovers like me, at least, is an unusual situation. The Ever Smart, um, I've finally been vindicated by the Supreme Court. Um, this was a, a situation where neither ship was keeping a good lookout. Uh, Alexandra won a poor oral lookout and Ever Smart a poor visual one. Uh, and there was a question about the application of the crossing rule uh, held at first instance in the Court of Appeal that it didn't apply and in the Supreme Court that it did. And how is a computer going to um, on either ship going to deal with those sorts of questions. Obviously that one has now been um, dealt with, but uh, the, the problem can still arise. You know, what, what do the rules mean in this circumstance? The Osseus David, Sakazai, Kalon and Panamax Alexander was a collision in the, a series of collisions in the Suez Canal, um, where all three ships were in a southbound convoy with the, um, uh, the, the current underneath them. Uh, and I think two things come from that. One, the ship handling was extremely difficult. And it may be that um, computers can be taught how to handle uh, Panamax bulk carriers, laden Panamax bulk carriers uh, in those conditions. But the other um, point is that when going through the Suez Canal, you have to have a, a Suez mooring boat on board with um, crews ready to take uh, lines to the shore. And it seems to me that a, a fully autonomous ship simply would have to have extra people on board to be able to cope with that. Um, Panamax Alexander was an unlucky ship because she was involved in another collision the next day. Um, I can't say too much about it, but um, she was pulled, uh, she would say, off her moorings by the passing of another ship. So a, a hydrodynamic uh, interference between the two. Um, and how the computers could deal with that is, a, is an interesting and difficult question.
um, it would require a, a, a lightning assessment of um, both the, the interaction between the vessels and uh, in the south going current, the vessels were going north, uh, and, uh, and what to do about it. Um, anyway, we shall find out from the Admiral to Judge in due course what the answer to that question was. Um, but um, the advantage of autonomy in that sort of situation is, is not easy uh, to identify. Anyway, I, I've said enough. Um, if all these problems I've been talking about don't get addressed, then I'll finish by saying I predict a bright future for maritime disputes lawyers. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed, um, James. Um, I'll now invite all three of the, uh, or two other, I should say, panelists back to the floor to field some questions, of which there are a small number, but of rather good questions. And uh, Katrina, um, this question from Paul is direct to you. So I'll ask you to um, come in on this one, which I believe the audience can see now. I don't know if you want to vocalize it for Paul. Um, yeah, certainly. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul has asked, uh, do I see the limits for changes in regulation matching the limits for existing ships, for example, 100 meter, 400 tons, or will other size limits be needed? Um, I think this is, I think this is a really important and interesting question. Um, and from my perspective at the current time, we're amending, for example, the workboat code within the limits that are already in the regulations. And I think it's really important that when we make changes or we're introducing regulations to support these vessels, we're mindful of the fact they're still going to operate next to conventional fully manned vessels. And actually it's gonna be really important that there's some consistency there. Saying that, I do also believe there will be an increase in the number of smaller vessels doing perhaps autonomous operations because the vessel can be smaller. But I don't necessarily think that means we need to then change the regulations and the limits to where they sort of, they kick in. That, that's my perspective on that one. Thanks Katrina. I've got another question here from Zoe, that uh, I've got a view on, and I, I don't know if James has some reflection on, it's the um, it, whether or rather the extent to which autonomous shipping is going to affect uh, limitation of liability. Um, uh, if you mean, which I assume you do, um, tonnage limitation ship and a limitation of liability under the um, uh, prevailing tonnage limitation conventions, LLMC 1976-1996. Um, um, Katrina, I'm sorry, I can't see a reason, and I've um, discussed this in, in, in previous writings, I can't see a reason why the owner of the um, autonomous vessel's entitlement to limit should be um, prejudiced by autonomy, so long as the vessel falls within the as long as the vessel falls within the um, uh, definition of ship for the purposes of the uh, particular instrument. But I, I don't see that particular entitlement necessarily being um, altered. Um, James, do you think I'm on the right uh, page here? Or do you have a, a radically different view? Uh, y yes, I do. I mean, what you may find is an expanded meaning of operators. Um, because you will quite literally have operators which are not operators in the sense that Mr. Justice here um, thought that they were, um, uh, or uh, an additional sense in that sense. Uh, but no, I, I don't uh, see that um, getting in the way. Thank you. We also had a um, we also had a question, a rather good question in the chat about. Um, the extent to which uh, parallels can be drawn between um, autonomous vessels and driverless cars. And uh, James, I don't know if you just want to um, pick up on that in view of uh, your um, reference to the legislation in that area just a moment ago. You did touch on it in your actual, in the main body of your piece. Yes, the, uh, obviously one looks at um, any example of um, regulatory approach to see if, um, I'm sorry, Robert, would you mind? Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
Um, uh, one looks at different examples of regulatory approach to see how that might be translated into uh, the maritime domain. The, the fundamental uh, difficulty, it seems to me, is that um, the regulation of road transport, autonomous or otherwise, is, can be exclusively um, territorial to the state in question. Obviously, um, even within the EU, you have different rules that uh, govern cars at any particular time. Um, but you, you cross a border and it's all pretty clear, but ship, ships by their very nature um, cross borders every day. That's what they're there for. And uh, the, that I think is the, the central difficulty. Um, it really needs, in other words, um, initiative at, at IMO level um, to um, see where we're gonna go. I also think te technically that um, in, in terms of the, the, the crunching of the data, we're just in a completely different place to road vehicles just because there are many fewer um, vessels and an awful lot more variety of ships and of shipping situations than is the case with road vehicles. That's excellent, James. Thank you. And there are a number, an increasing number of uh, very good questions in the uh, Q&A box, but I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there because we've exhausted our allotted time for um, this afternoon. Um, before I leave you, can I uh, just take the opportunity at this point to uh, say thanks to our two guest speakers, uh, Dr. Katrina Kemp and James Turner QC. Thank you both very much for coming in and giving us your insight and perspective on some of these matters. I found it very interesting to listen to you both. And of course, the biggest thanks of all going out to uh, you all, our audience, for uh, joining us today and for your engagement and participation from wherever you are currently in the world. Uh, we very much hope you'll join us again. And uh, on behalf of everyone at the Institute of uh, Maritime Law, take care, stay safe. Until next time, goodbye for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>